Nice. Okay. Well, it's 101 and the outlook phenomenon has happened and everybody's joining promptly <laughs> at one. So Claudia, I'll get started. If I may, I'll introduce you briefly. Yes. To those who don't know you, again, uh, many do. So um, Claudia um, uh, originally was trained in Germany, did infectious disease in Boston at Harvard, uh, um, did a postdoc here in Montreal with Madhu, and then went to FIND uh, for five years where she directed the TB diagnostics uh, efforts. And then um, after conquering the world there, <laughs> went to Heidelberg where she's trying to establish a strong research program, I guess against all odds. So she's <laughs> gonna talk to us about, so Claudia is really a global expert in TB diagnostics um, and uh, brings both obviously a lot of clinical expertise, uh, but also uh, research expertise. So Claudia is going to talk to us about the latest and greatest in TB diagnostics and also some questions posed either by email by Marcel about what exactly does it take for a diagnostic to be considered ready to go. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Dick. Um, can you see my slides in the proper mode? I can. Yeah, exactly. I don't know about everybody else. Good. Exactly. Good. So thank you very much. Um, and um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, Montreal is my, uh, I would say, research home uh, where I have learned a lot and have started um, my research career. And so my, my heart is very much still in Montreal with many of you, with certainly Madhu, who was my um, my main mentor there, but others like Dick with my favorite uh, paper still title, The Explosion in the Spaghetti Factory. So yeah, lots of lots of fond memories um, and wonderful, wonderful to see you all here. Thanks for coming on. Good. So I will try to, uh, yeah, I'll try to fill all of the expectations for this talk. I will tell many things that you know, that you have known from Madhu and others, but I hope I can tell you a little bit uh, of new things as well. Um, very good. So this is something I'll go over quickly because you know it. The main thing that I want to convey is this is the diagnostic gap that we are facing for tuberculosis. It's bigger than it was in the past. And um, it is it remains also big for drug resistant TB, even though there have been lots of efforts made um, to, to close that with, with expert over the past years. But we are still very much in, a, in an area of, uh, um, of scarcity of diagnostics. Fact is that uh, microscopy is still the most frequently used um, diagnostic test globally. And uh, at the level where we really want to get people uh, to have uh, their questions on what am I suffering from answered, we have nothing. Um, and also thinking of drug resistant TB, we have uh, very little, if we think of expert uh, with um, the RIF resistance, yes, now with XDR, the cartridge or more bio uh, coming uh, in uh, increasingly also outside of India, but it's still insufficient. And uh, when we talk here in Germany and probably also in Canada of personalized care, this is something that uh, people can only dream of. And I always love uh, Madhu's envisioning, re-envisioning TV care um, um, lectures. Uh, and this is essentially um, uh, something down that line. What do we need really locally um, um, in that level zero, level one? We need uh, diagnostics that reach people. We need diagnostics that at least um, tell us the ones that are unlikely to have TB so that we can focus on the ones that are likely to have TB and get them proper diagnosis, at least at a level one, level two, ideally already with a comprehensive DST portfolio 
Um, and then I think you should be aiming for a uh, um, comprehensive DST uh, to enable personalized care for those few with very resistant uh, TB uh, at reference levels. And all of this needs to be fully integrated, linked um, um, through e-health solutions and uh, obviously system strengthening. And um, oh, I didn't realize there was an animation now. Yeah. Um, so like in terms of the work that I'm trying to focus on, it's the value cycle of, of I would say, public health research at large, but also diagnostics research. A lot of work that I have been doing and still do is to define what the need is really and what the feasibility is of novel diagnostics, then with mathematical modeling to look at their potential at FIND, I was very much involved with like discovery and, and development as well. And now I'm more involved with uh, in line with need and feasibility to design like human centered uh, design, research, engineering, then the assessment of performance. And then it comes to clinical utility, defining the value with economic work, um, where Kevin also has a lot of expertise. Um, so a little bit on my work and a little bit on uh, uh, more general diagnostics work um, that I wanted to present you here. So this is, um, uh, first of all, the non-sputum based uh, pipeline of diagnostic tests. I think there's a lot uh, in the mix uh, and in the works, but also some setbacks, some, um, uh, some substantial uh, progress that has been made. And I want to highlight that a little bit. Um, we did this uh, uh, with Emily uh, a couple of years back where we looked at the pipeline uh, of markers, biomarkers that actually would enable point of care diagnostic tests because a point of care diagnostic test uh, is not going to be uh, um, an RNA or molecular test most, most likely. It's more likely going to be uh, a protein marker um, or breath test. Um, and there we found a lot of papers uh, in the pipeline, but very, and like small studies that suggested that markers were promising, as you could see from this uh, graph where you have specificity on the X axis, sensitivity on the right axis, and you have the um, uh, targets of the target product profile for diagnostic tests and triage tests here. So you want to be in this area, lots of uh, markers that uh, show promise, but then when you see the larger studies coming and those are the larger dots on this graph, you see the um, uh, performance dropping off. And also what we saw really was that a lot of papers were just very poorly reported uh, with um, and studies very insufficient in terms of limiting bias and um, and uh, having representative patient populations and this led us to do this um, JID supplement with many partners around the world including um, many of you um, to um, provide guidance on what trials should be looking like or what evidence should be looking like for policy on high priority target product profiles. And this is just a general note. But now I want to uh, go into specifics on some of the markers. Um, so Fuji Lam, you have all heard of it by now. Um, this is a paper, this is now already like uh, two years old. Uh, where we have done a comparative performance analysis of Fuchilam and Alilam and HIV positive patients across three populations, um, um, three, three study populations in, in um, South Africa, and showed that Fuchilam, um, and I actually have uh, one here, uh, so just so that you can see it uh, in, in real life. Um, uh, can uh, improve uh, upon the sensitivity of the commercially available allele alarm. And as you can see already from this, it's not like the typical pregnancy test that you have. It is a, um, it is a, a test that has a few more steps to do uh, that being said, um, and in that it's, it's more complicated. That being said, it doesn't require instruments uh, to read. It doesn't require electricity. So it does keep with a point of care profile that we were hoping for and does improve sensitivity through signal amplification and better antibodies. 
um, and does so to improve sensitivity by 30%. And here, uh, not so much, but uh, in other studies, we have shown lower specificity in comparison to Alialam. I think a lot of that is uh, related to the reference standard because these are patients um, who have typically um, uh, disseminated uh, TB or uh, TB in extrapulmonary parts of the body. And if we look at um, the specificity in patient groups where we are more likely to find TB because it's uh, less difficult to find, like the HIV patients with CD4 counts of more than 200, then actually specificity is, is quite good. And that confirms our an analytical data that also showed that uh, the Fuji LAM has much less cross reactivity in comparison to a LIR LAM. But still, uh, it's, it's far away from the perfect test that we would like to have, but it is better, I think, than the sensitivity would allow us to say, because the fact is that urine is a very easy sample to get. Um, and if we look at diagnostic yield, which combines essentially the ability to get a sample with the performance of the test on that sample, then the urine lamb actually outperformed in this study the sputum expert uh, also by almost 30%. And this is because especially in these patients with advanced HIV, they can barely bring up a sputum. And that's why expert um, often cannot be done. In this study, actually only 36% of people were able to produce a sputum, which was on the lower side. And this was advanced HIV for the most part hospitalized. But uh, generally, um, sputum is difficult to get in HIV positive patients. And across studies, you see between the 36 and max like 70, 80% of people actually able to produce a sputum. And that way, urine tests can improve. Um, but if you were to do a urine expert, that would already also capture some of those uh, patients, but obviously with the limitations of, a, of an expert test in terms of availability, cost, and all of that. If we look at HIV negative patients, obviously the added yield of Fujilam is not as high as compared to HIV positive. So there many people can produce a sputum and can have a, an expert sputum test, uh, but there are still a few that are um, uh, captured in addition. And what I actually was very excited about is also to see the performance of Fujilam in extrapulmonary TB. So people who have um, TB just in the brain or to have uh, like TB meningitis or just a lymph node uh, infected, still do have actually quite a lot of um, uh, lipoarabinomannan uh, that can be captured in the urine. And this also uh, taught us uh, to overcome this old uh, dogma that uh, genitourinary uh, capture of, of, uh, of TB is only when the genitourinary tract is involved, more, more likely actually the, the mycobacteria or at least parts of the mycobacteria as, um, circulate in the blood and get fil filtrated through the glomerular filtration membrane. And that's why we can, with urine lamp tests, actually capture te TB that's very focal um, in not genitourinary parts of the, uh, of the body. And imagine like a TB meningitis, 50% being captured with Fuji Lam. Um, that would make a difference for many people, especially for a disease that is so rapidly fa fatal. Um, we also, as I had said earlier, we are doing also qualitative work. Uh, in this case, we did a um, semi-structured interview of patients, healthcare providers, and operators, as well as decision makers of tests. We did that uh, during full-blown um, COVID pandemic um, with collaborators in Malawi and in, in Zambia, and were able to elicit a bit more about what are barriers and facilitators of, of um, urine testing. Nora Engel, um, who you all know well as well, uh, was, a, was a partner uh, in this study. And uh, there were some surprises and some things that we expected, uh, but I think it also shed a bit of light on, on why uh, the allele alarm is not so um, uh, much picked up as we ha would have hoped it to be picked up uh, in light of the fact that it does have an impact on mortality overall. And what we saw was that uh, people were concerned about the availability and also the security 
in sanitary facilities, especially in very peripheral settings, change in agency health care providers, so the, the people in the clinics actually were very much opposed in part to urine because they felt like um, they weren't able to, 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 to get to it. They weren't able to um, make a person pee on the spot. There would much more obviously like a blood sample where they can pick and probe and get something rather than a urine sample. Um, and um, if HIV testing is a pre-requirement, uh, then people were thinking that it would likely get um, similar to a Lealam, very little uptake. Um, and then also um, the perception of urine not being a sample for TB diagnosis was something that, uh, that patients actually voiced, um, that they just didn't trust in urine uh, yielding a TB result. And all of those things, I think, are very interesting to understand, both for implementation interventions, uh, the, the, um, what you need to do to make a test be accepted, um, and um, how like tests uh, are viewed from from different stakeholders. Um, this will be part of the, the WHO review on urine lamb tests next year um, and um, will be probably complemented by a DCE um, over the next months if we're able to pull it off. I've always been very excited about lamb tests not so much because of Fuji lam itself. It's nice to see 30% increased sensitivity, but more because um, I think it paves the path uh, to better uh, diagnostics and there's a lot more we can do. Um, on the one hand, we know better now what to target, also what are more specific targets um, through epitope mapping, lamp structure, um, 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 elicitation, and then um, we are able to generate better antibodies. Um, and our tests for detection have improved. A lot uh, depended on the increased sensitivity of, of capture and concentration um, uh, and detection uh, with novel um, diagnostics. And all of this, several groups are working to put together to get the best of the best, as BMGF is saying, um, and there is hope that this uh, will yield really to a much more sensitive test in the coming years. That being said, there was a setback recently um, uh, and the timeline that was very ambitious uh, now has to be pushed back at least um, a couple of years uh, because uh, the science behind uh, LAM, I think, needs, needs further work and especially like the um, reference um, products to, for developers actually needs further work in order to, to make, get to the next step. So much for LAM. Um, triage, I think we should not uh, let the perfect be the enemy of the good, meaning let's uh, potentially not only focus on getting to a perfect diagnostic test, but if we were to get to something that, that is highly sensitive and compromises on specificity, that might already be a good step forward. Um, and if we talk about <clears throat> uh, compromising on specificity, we obviously uh, think about host markers uh, that will never be specific enough to really meet a diagnostic uh, target. But the question there to ask is, does it really meet the performance target? Can it be translated into a POC that's affordable? And that's especially the case for host R mRNA. Um, and um, I just want to um, look at that data available uh, briefly. So this is data that's um, currently in the process of being written up. Um, this is work um, that um, the culmination of work over several years, actually, where I find um, that was with Somologic. Some of you might know uh, a screen happen of over 5,000 uh, biomarkers um, down selected to 57 <clears throat> validated those in a three country study and down selected further for, to 12 biomarkers and then uh, validated in a thousand patient uh, a study uh, in three countries, Peru, Vietnam, and South Africa. And um, when I was at FIND, we analyzed this data and with conventional methods and realized that it wasn't meeting our targets. And then we wanted to give it one more try and I have a mathematician in my team. <clears throat> I'll drink something quickly. 
who uh, performed um, uh, machine learning analyses on these uh, with various techniques trying to get to the answer whether we really need to um, um, forget about um, host protein markers after this extensive effort or whether there is still something that we can learn from it and potentially bring forward. And what we realize with all of this work is um, that there is a ceiling effect. Uh, more than two, maximum three biomarkers don't give you more uh, knowledge um, on whether uh, there is TB or not. Um, and also there is variability uh, geographically. And actually the only time when we were able to reach into that upper left-hand uh, uh, corner here where the, uh, the targets for the TPPs would have been met for the triage TPP is when we actually leave out the Vietnam data. Uh, so for South Africa and Peru, we were able to reach up there, but just about. Um, and if we were to include uh, Vietnam data, then it doesn't. Also, interestingly, and this might be related, um, is uh, HIV is, is uh, um, it seems to be performing better in HIV positive. But the feasibility of a unifying signature of a test, of a global test, uh, is very much, um, I think, in question. Um, and broader validation is necessary, but um, yeah people are kind of losing steam um, because, um, because there are huge setbacks on this uh, along the way. The only group that's still working on this is Gerhard Walzl's group in South Africa. Um, and uh, they have mostly done that, uh, mostly generated data from South Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa, and it's always been promising. So we'll have to wait to see whether it stand up, the signature stands up to the challenge of a broader global trial. Host mRNA signatures uh, also have been evaluated uh, for diagnosis and triage. Uh, we did a study in HIV positives um, and uh, found it to be performing reasonably well. Here again is the TPP of um, uh, triage, the, the, um, the optimal and minimal. Um, and there was recently a study also by uh, Gerhard Walser's group, Jane Sutherland, um, that um, confirmed this data in uh, a broader uh, patient group in a CAD paper. That being said, um, overall, both of these studies uh, were somewhat biased in their patient pop population, and we're waiting to see whether this holds up. Uh, but we had actually a data uh, analysis meeting last night with our R2D group, R2D2 group um, and our data from a, a large international effort is actually somewhat confirming this independent of HIV status. I was always more skeptical uh, about these mRNA signatures, but maybe it was too skeptical. Nevertheless, um, I think the cost targets um, are still a huge question mark because any mRNA signature is not going to be cheaper than a current molecular test. And then what's the point in having a triage test? But I think these um, mRNA signatures have uh, potentially a role in prediction, um, although they all seem to be kind of performing similarly and similarly limited. But in the last six months prior to um, uh, active disease, clinically active disease, uh, they seem to be um, um, indicating that um, there is disease and that uh, it is going to progress. So there might be a role, but probably more so again um, in, in uh, resource um, richer settings. Monitoring, I think, is also a very promising uh, target, uh, particularly when it comes to, to resistant TB. So the host response cartridge from Cephate um, is uh, the uh, cartridge that the only mRNA test today that's um, translated into a test that is close to commercialization. Um, and uh, this is uh, the data that I have uh, showed you before, and that was recently confirmed by the, by the CID paper. 
That being said, I want to highlight one thing um, that actually CRP on this um, rock curve that you can see here on the bottom left um, is the red line and the black line is the host response cartridge. Um, so CRP actually did not perform um, so much uh, worse than the uh, host response cartridge. Um, and um, we'll have to see really what the added benefit is of paying, let's say 10 bucks in comparison to like two bucks for a CRP um, um, and having uh, instrument and, and electricity free point of care test. Although the CRP test in this study was a laboratory assay, um, so we also first need to compare it to point of care assays, and this is something that we are doing in R2D2 right now. Children testing, um, extremely difficult, as you all know. Um, there has been a lot of effort put into stool testing um, in terms of pre-processing, optimizing pre-processing to get stool uh, be evaluated by expert. Um, there were three groups working on it. I initiated a, a find in parallel. There was KNCV and the TB Speed Consortium funded by Unitaid. Um, we brought them all together um, and evaluated uh, head to head and just analyzed the data. You might have seen it at the union, but overall, um, the sensitivity um, at the uh, data presented in the trial from FIND and TB Speed was about 50% um, uh, amongst all patients, children with TB. And that was actually very similar, surprisingly, I have to say, across the three um, means of processing. And I'm saying surprisingly, because especially KNCV is a very simplistic protocol, which just uses um, uh, a bunch more buffer um, as provided by Cepheid um, and a bit of like letting it sit, shaking it while um, at find and TB speed as well. We had not had success with that in, in initial clinical or laboratory studies and proceeded to develop a more complex um, uh, procedure, but it might not be necessary. And the clinical trial actually showed that it's not and KNC we was right in their assessment of, of keeping it simple. We also did a cost effectiveness analysis um, of this. And not surprisingly, from what I just told you with the, um, the SOS, the KNCV version of, of processing, um, uh, it was the best performing one. But uh, we also showed that obviously with 50% or 52% sensitivity, um, there is uh, a certain threshold um, that is required in order to really make this a cost effective tool. It was actually for the first time for me that I showed that diagnostics weren't cost effective unless you actually um, increased prevalence to 7% um, or, or higher. Um, and only then are these tools cost effective, which means like all of these groups set out for to have these stool pre-processing tools be implemented in a peripheral setting uh, to get a diagnosis closer to the, to the kids. But fact is that in these peripheral settings, prevalence is more in the range of two to 3% and not 7%. And that's why it's actually not likely um, that um, that many countries uh, will be able to, to make the decision to, to put these in practice. Um, CUT, computer assisted digital reading, as you all uh, are very familiar of, uh, from the work of FICE, uh, who I think is also listening. Um, the he was part of a huge effort um, um, led by FIND uh, to try to analyze uh, the three most advanced uh, CAT solutions from CAT 4 TB, the Netherlands, Cure AI, uh, India, and LUNIT, um, Japan, Korea. This data was reviewed um, in, sorry, here, this data, oops. Yeah, yeah, was reviewed by the WHO last, last year and we are in the process of finishing the papers has taken longer um, than it should. But essentially what we showed um, um, in uh, these analyses was that across um, different data sets for two use, use cases, both screening and uh, triage, 
um, these cut solutions a perform quite similar um, none is really uh, standing out on its own and they are um, uh, comparable to um, expert readers uh, which is the um, uh, the purple point here with the confidence interval in, in both directions um, and this data, in addition to the data that Stop TB and FIVE presented, led to the WHO essentially recommending these cut solutions as an alternative to radiologist readers. And I think it's, it's good because most of those studies were performed against expert readers, and there's a big gap on, um, uh, on having expert readers in countries. And this, um, in line also with um, development on the instrument side, having more portable um, X-rays, such as the, the X-Air from Fujifilm, um, um, will be able to, will make um, radiology reading uh, much more accessible and using CUT much more as a screening and triage tool in countries. Ultrasound, I think, uh, is uh, the next uh, step to, uh, to take uh, when it comes to AI. Um, it's more complex, uh, as all of the clinicians amongst you can imagine. Um, but I think it has also a lot more um, possibilities in that it's a um, doesn't have the radiation and the instruments are much more portable um, than X-ray images. Uh, still are today and we are evaluating that uh, in a study uh, in Germany and India um, where we are looking on the one hand whether existing protocols such as the FASH protocol uh, that's been established for uh, emergency uh, use uh, of ultrasound to, to find uh, most critical findings and additional findings uh, on top of that could help us A, to diagnose TB, particularly extrapulmonary TB, um, and also to uh, monitor um, treatment uh, response um, in, um, in patients with uh, particularly extrapulmonary TB. And we'll use this data set um, as an initial training data set uh, for machine learning approaches as well. Uh, trying to establish like common protocols uh, with developers we have spoken to, um, QAI, to Watvani, Butterfly, and others, all of the ones that are looking at this for, for TB right now. So lots of uh, interesting work going on here as well. Uh, molecular testing. Um, there also is a lot that happened uh, over the recent years. Uh, and I think the most exciting one really is small bio. Um, and Omni, I forgot to cross that out, um, unfortunately is not coming to the market um, as some of you or maybe all of you know already. This is old news. This was our ultra work um, uh, that we did to validate the ultra and get it to WHO recommendation 2018. Molbio, this is a very recent paper. Um, this is a, a study that I initiated and that I'm very proud of because I, I was one of the few people who believed in Molbio also, probably because uh, Madhu got me in touch with them as one of the very first uh, things that he, he did when, he, when I came to Montreal. One of my very first studies was actually with Molbio. And even though they weren't performing well at the time, you could see the drive and energy in that company and the willingness to do good. Um, and they did good in the end. And in our study that's published in ERJ now, um, we showed um, in a three country trial uh, in uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, Ethiopia, and Peru, um, that these uh, the test is essentially uh, performing similar to uh, expert MTB RIF a little less than uh, expert MTB RIF Ultra, although their um, cartridge, the MTB Plus, is coming close to the ultra sensitivity. In terms of RIF resistance, I still want to see better data. I think there they have a little bit further to go. Um, and they are also much more flexible in their design so that they can easily generate another chip on INH or a bit dark with an olinase. 
um, and uh, generate a more flexible workflow uh, depending on the regimen that is uh, of interest for a, a patient at hand. Uh, and also what is exciting about MoBio is uh, the two-step. On the one hand, it's more complicated. They have a separate um, um, extraction and uh, detection is uh, on a separate machine, but it also offers opportunities and especially with sequencing becoming more and more um, adopted in countries as well, this will be an advantage and the, the, um, the extraction of the mobile is actually one of the best uh, and we have shown that in our studies, but also the Gates Foundation has shown that in unpublished data that their true prep is really working excellently. Centralized platforms also of interest, but more kind of because of economies of scale. Um, for countries like South Africa and like Kenya, where there's a lot of HIV testing happening on centralized platforms, it does make sense to potentially have a, a test, um, a TB test on those platforms as well. And um, essentially all those tests perform similarly uh, to expert. Um, I won't go into details here, uh, but they were also recommended by the WHO. I think one thing that is very exciting is um, um, the development that has happened on alternative sampling methods, in part um, uh, boosted by the COVID work, uh, but in part already happening beforehand. Um, swaps um, of the tongue or buccal area um, also show a lot of promise for TB detection. Uh, this is work from Jerry Gangelosi from Seattle um, that has now been uh, taken up by the Gates Foundation and uh, separate work streams and other groups that we are supporting in R2D2 as well. Uh, and there has been innovation both in terms of uh, material innovation, but also in terms of what is the best uh, area of the uh, mouse to sample and what is the best uh, processing thereafter um, um, to, to get the most out of TB factors, um, mo most uh, out of that sample. Fact is that the bacterial loads um, in the mouth are lower. And so we also need very sensitive backends um, and our existing molecular tests might not be sensitive enough um, to really get to the uh, sensitivities that we get with sputum-based methods, but uh, with also increasingly more sensitive uh, back-end molecular tests, we might be able to overcome that. There was very promising data from um, mask sampling. To what extent it really actually is a diagnostic test or more an infection control or screening test still so needs to be determined. I hope all of you were at the recent TB Science uh, that I was uh, allowed to chair this year um, on bioaerosols. Um, I think this is a very promising area. And actually one of my PhD students just founded a startup um, and is trying to uh, also work on uh, bioaerosol sampling uh, for TB. S saliva spit gargle testing, like we have seen it for COVID, unlikely to, to happen for TB anytime soon, but also something to keep an eye on. The expert XDR uh, also just recently published in Lancet ID, you might have uh, seen it, um, um, is, uh, I, I would say, a next, uh, yeah, a test in the armamentarium that we have, how much uptake it will really get, I'm honestly doubtful. I was trying really hard at the time when I was involved in the development of this to kick out the aminoglycosides and put in linazolid. But I can tell you I was overvoted. <laughs> and the consequence is that today we have a test that is in parts really outdated um, and uh, is expensive, requires a changeover of systems. It requires a 10 color calibration and module exchange or whole instrument exchange. And all of this is going to limit the uptake of uh, this essay. And I have to say rightly so. Uh, I don't think this is really what uh, the countries are needing. And I think uh, MoBio with its more flexible 
um, detection method is, is uh, probably more promising there, uh, but they need further data on their um, expanded DST portfolio to, to um, make a mark here. And sequencing, um, I had already commented on, I think this is coming, there's the seek and treat work or find um, that's happening. There's the increasing knowledge that we gain from the, um, from the data, Cryptic, Resec, WHO, um, and a lot of other groups. And we are understanding the genotype better and sequencing will uh, replace, I think, phenotypic DST uh, because it will be getting cheaper. It will be getting easier than establishing culture-based BSL-3 labs. Yeah, other ongoing work that I'm doing, I already mentioned on occasion, the R2D2 uh, network that I have uh, established together with Aditya Katamanshi and Payam Nahid. Um, it's, a, it's a trial network where we are trying to, in parallel, evaluate a lot of novel tests um, and trying to do so iteratively. So we give the opportunity for test developers to really use a platform um, and, and uh, develop on the side and bring in the improved products along the way. Um, we have evaluated a lot already. We're at the end of the first year also, as you can imagine, delayed somewhat by COVID. Um, and we'll have some data on this uh, coming in, um, in uh, conferences in the next months. Uh, most um, noticeably, I think, will be the uh, sampling of the mouth with uh, the swaps that I alluded to um, and uh, some CRP testing on point of care platforms. Um, but there's still, and obviously the host protein signature of, uh, of Cephage, for the, I'm sorry, here it is. No, here it is. Um, but, um, but yeah, this is data. We literally just yesterday night uh, reviewed it um, and I wasn't able to, to put it in yet. Um, I also do a lot of other things um, with my team here and you might be thinking, what the heck, hypertension? But um, as Madhu knows well from his work, there's a big diagnostic gap um, um, on hypertension as well. And we have huge uh, capacity here with the Heidelberg Institute of Global Health. They are essentially owning this data base on um, cardiometabolic diseases. And we use that to do an agent-based model uh, in partnership with our scientific computing center um, to assess what should be the next intervention on diagnostics for hypertension um, and have some interesting findings that we just last week um, discussed with FIND and, um, and um, hope to be publishing as well. We're looking at some innovative modeling here. Um, uh, the team in, in Montreal uh, is also involved. Um, and looking at how we can better actually understand accuracy data with patient latent class analyses. Um, and we are looking, I'll skip this for now, we are looking also to better understand really what does it take to transform diagnostics. The, the question about um, should it be a centralized versus decentralized? What could be, is in my way like too dichotomous and uh, we need to understand better in what places decentralized makes sense and in what places centralized makes sense. And that needs a more complete analysis of equity, of value and of accuracy. And we're trying to do that on the side of a EDCTP study. Um, that, um, that I initiated. And now I'm getting back to something that uh, Dick asked me to answer, um, coming back to this value cycle of diagnostics research. Um, this is, I tried to tell you a little bit about where we work. Um, and I want to comment on, uh, with all of this work that I showed you, when actually a WHO review happens. It typically happens uh, at the time when we uh, have performance data, as I think you saw from the presentation. But why do we not really wait until we get uh, clinical utility data, so impact data? This is really what counts. And I think uh, we have learned a lot from expert in that uh, 
um, it didn't have the impact that we projected it to be when we were modeling things on economic and and um, and transmission potential all the way back in 2010. And the paper um, that used actually implementation data was much more sobering. Um, and so why are we not waiting for that? Fact is that um, it's, it would delay uh, the access uh, to diagnostics substantially. And for experts, it took many years to get to that clinical utility data. Um, and also for some, we just have um, surrogate markers. And I think expert in that uh, is also a good example because expert today, there's no data to suggest that it has mortality benefit. That's what we would be looking for in a clinical utility study. But expert, unlike, unlike uh, a Lee alarm, is a test that's used in patients who are not so much likely to die. And uh, we actually analyzed that at one point with Samuel together uh, and showed that we would need a study of about 30,000 people uh, to show a mortality benefit of experts. So should we have waited for that study? Should we have waited for further implementation studies um, to understand uh, really what the clinical utility is? I think what we need to do is to better understand need and feasibility to better integrate um, really like uh, the um, people's voice, the end user's voice in the discovery, in the development to make sure that we can predict better um, what the clinic clinical utility is going to be. But I think waiting for you, you impact data before we at least uh, get country, give countries the opportunity to see how a test would work in their context uh, would, would be uh, problematic. And I'm sure also Madhu would have an opinion on that. Just before I stop, as you can imagine, I did a lot of COVID in the last year and a half as well. And I don't know if Olivia is on, but she contacted me just now about a COVID paper that I uh, published on surveillance. Um, I did a lot on tests, I did a lot on uh, surveillance, and I'm still running an active 13 center plasma trial, believe it or not. You would think it's not useful anymore, but it still, I think, has a use. Um, and But I'm heavily trying to get back full time into TB and extract myself from this COVID craziness and, um, and make sure that we um, catch up on what we've lost in the year and a half and make use of all of the innovation that's been uh, uh, put forward for COVID both on the technolo technology side as well as on the digital side um, to, um, to, to uh, make up for like the losses that we have seen in case finding and so forth. And with that, I'll end and sorry, it took a bit longer. Wanted to end at 45, took five minutes longer. That's Six. perfect. Thank you, Claudia. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, terrific. Yes, applause. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'll stop. Yeah, then I see you. So uh, questions? <laughs> Feel free to turn on your uh, video so we can see that who else is actually looking at the screen especially if you want to ask a question. Um, hey, Lena. Hey, Alex. Hey, Emily. So, so Claudia, I'll just go first. Um, so the, um, I, I was glad to see that you mentioned CAD and so on, but have you kind of looked at the uptake or what it would take to scale up x-rays? I mean, it's not obviously at the most peripheral center, but you know, the, the, with the new digital units, you can put them anywhere with a bit of electricity. Um, and with CAD for TB, you now have the possibility of not worrying too much about interpretation. So have you looked at that as a, as a scale up potential? Yes, actually, the Gates Foundation looked at that uh, with a, um, and, and Chai uh, with a quite extensive analysis. Um, and um, and uh, they have uh, uh, led uh, essentially the Gates Foundation to refocus a little bit in terms of, uh, um, I would say, more away from chest X-ray um, and more towards really point of care um, 
uh, testing, may that be through swaps or, or breath testing, um, because um, the investment needed uh, and the reach um, is, is substantial. Um, and at the, that being said, I think, uh, I would say that for uh, for diagnostic purpose, I think for a screening purpose, active case finding purpose, um, uh, it's still very much um, um, considered, uh, and I think rightly so, um, because um, with those new more portable X-rays, uh, you can really reach people um, similar to what was done as you all know, in, in Europe or other places uh, to, to um, really drive incidents of, of TB down. And fact is, it's the, the test really that uh, gets us right now probably still the best uh, capture of, of preclinical TB. Um, and so uh, there are a lot of benefits, but I'm sure <clears throat> others in the, in the uh, round here have opinions on that as well, Thais or Madhu? I don't know if, um, well, I mean, my only opinion is that it's also useful when people present with cough, you know, you do all these other tests for TB and you can say, okay, it's not TB, great. Yes. But then most patients will ask you, well, you know, I don't what really want it? to know it's not <laughs> TB. I want to know what it is. Yes, absolutely. So the x-ray does help you there. Yeah. And anyway. I think there yeah. actually we're doing a study that I didn't mention right now, because I think for the screening purpose, the problem there is with the cut tools that it's uh, poorly understood um, how well they actually capture non-TB pathologies. Um, and this was something, I forget if you were involved in 2016 in that radiology review that Knut led, um, that, um, that came up in the discussion over and over. And to this day, I didn't see anyone addressing it. So we are trying to actually address that using the hospital here where we have well characterized um, um, uh, radiographs and run them through TB um, uh, cut solutions. Um, because like if you go out there and screen and test, um, if it doesn't recognize the big heart, um, um, have you really done good for the people or have you just uh, reassured them um, um, falsely? Yeah. Sure. So can I, Kevin, I know you've got your hand up for a while, but can we just ask fast to comment on that? Because he did, again, quite a lot of that review on the non-TB issue for CAD or for all of the AI interpretation. It's fast. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, it's it, it really remains an open question. We're looking at the data set that we collected from Pakistan uh, with that, but the problem, I mean, there's many problems. The ultimate problem is that TB care is traditionally is just focused on TB and there are, people are not clearly referred once TB has been ruled out. Um, so to collect that data and to know what happens, it's, there's just like no linkage between TB and non-TB care. Um, whether that's fair to put it on TB programs or not, I mean, that's like a other question. But um, we are we are looking at the data that we collected in Pakistan. That was people presenting with symptoms yeah. for TB care, and twelve percent had. Uh, go, go ahead. Twelve uh, percent had uh, TB, but we're going to try to see what the others were ultimately treated with. But again, there's no gold standard or um, rigorous way to know what they ended up being diagnosed with. The other thing with the, these CAD programs is they report nodule and cardiomegaly and all sorts of stuff, but I have yet to see a single paper uh, showing that that data, that that output has been um, validated. validated against any, um, any reference standard. So we're trying to also do that at the MUHC, uh, but kind of bogged down in ethics uh, for, for that work. We should connect on that uh, because that's what we are trying to do here right now. And in our migrant population, also very difficult ethically, but um, to at least get a representative population of what uh, we want to look at, but with a capacity to work up the differential diagnosis of a university hospital mm -hmm. in Heidelberg. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, thanks for a great talk, Claudia. It's nice to see you. And I, I'm just kind of wondering when you sleep, but that's not my, my question. Um, <laughs> um, well, I, I, well, I guess one quick comment is, of course, the, the, the point you showed about, you know, uh, WHO looking more at results after implementation, of course, there's a bit of a, a catch-22 because there's no implementation to implementation until WHO approves it, right? So are many in many settings, right? So I mean, obviously, yes, pragmatic trials, but you know, there's, uh, you know, sample size and expense issues with that. But my question or comment, it's, I guess the question is that something that I've found very difficult um, when, for example, doing some of the cost effectiveness modeling, that when you, one looks at a new intervention or diagnostic of whatever kind, and, and you may not have done a little bit of work in the CAD space, is actually not articulating what the intervention is, but art articulating the comparator. In other words, what is actually going on, quote unquote, normally? And and uh, you know, you probably know that to to model this, you actually need a pretty explicit articulation of every step in the diagnostic pathway, and you know why people get one thing and why these other people get a different thing, and so on. How do you handle that in in the work you're doing? Yeah, extremely difficult. And I have to say the work on the pediatric uh, TP has brought us uh, to a new level of uh, complexity there. Because there, there is, uh, I mean, hardly any knowledge, especially in peripheral settings of the true pathway. And we really try to walk uh, things through. We were only able to do it in Uganda, wanted to do it in India as well. Um, but because of COVID couldn't. Um, but we really walked, uh, walked people through the steps and try to uh, gather as much data as possible. Uh, but there are so many uncertainties in that. And uh, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's usually uh, complicated and limiting also the outputs of these um, cost effectiveness analyses. And that's why I think to your first point also, I think what should happen definitely with every um, approval of the WHO of a novel test is um, um, funding from an agency to do these operational studies, to do this um, a guided implementation, to gather that data um, so that uh, the, um, the initial implementation is getting you that data that informs on the one hand your um, economic evaluation, on the other hand, um, your performance in the context of the country setting so that uh, it can be then a more uh, informed scale up. Um, but that hasn't happened. That hasn't happened for expert at the time. That hasn't happened for a Lee alarm. And that would be, I think, something that would be usually helpful. I try to force Unitate um, or for not, how can I force Unitate, but convince Unitate um, to, to put money in that. And I think Madhu was more uh, successful <laughs> in parts. Um, uh, so we'll see what comes out of that um, uh, unit aid work um, in the near future. But, um, but I think that's hugely important that we do the implementation research company to and get the data to inform our models um, with the initial introduction and not once we've seen it fails or it doesn't work as well as we expected it. Okay, great. Uh, Hafid, welcome, by the way. Hello, all. Uh, Claudia, thank you for this impressive talk, as always. It's very interesting. So it's nice to see you all. So I have uh, maybe uh, one question about uh, uh, micro, maybe some RNA biomarkers. So uh, some publication they claim that some RNA, mainly microRNA uh, biomarkers are very excellent or have good sensitivity about, they claim that they can distinguish between latent TB and active TB. And mainly even the sensitivity is higher for some incipient TB. So what do you think about this biomarker? But in other hand, some studies want to assess this biomarker in different population, but the outcome was very different. So do you think it's really some genetic background of the population sets? Yeah, Hafid, yeah. thank you for that question. I think it's, a, it's um, multiple things. Um, so I think they're much less promising that the studies would let, want to let us believe. 
Um, and I think some data recently, for example, on how well they differentiate viral diseases also put a, a damp or on uh, their performance. They very much detect COVID, for example, as well. Um, and uh, I think what the point you're making on uh, like geographic um, um, diversity in performance, I'm not sure if it's like um, a host uh, aspect or if it's a comorbidity aspect. Like, um, for example, they have been studied mostly in countries where there's not a lot of uh, parasitic co-infections, like the very southern tip of Africa. Um, if you look at the data from like Gambia, Uganda, they suddenly perform a bit less well already. And then maybe there are host aspects uh, as well, looking the, at the performance variability between Asia and, and South Africa. So I think we understand them too poorly at this point. Um, and I think, um, and I think um, uh, there's a lot more knowledge to be gained before they really can uh, get uptake. That being said, I was surprised uh, by the recent good data um, of the three gene signature that uh, was published in CID on an interim analysis and actually our interim analysis last night um, that I saw the data. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I'm cautiously, very cautiously optimistic um, but more data needed. Yeah, uh, my second question is about some mycobacteriophage therapy. Is there any wide studies uh, uh, by WHO or France in the plan? Mycobacteriophage? Yeah. Um, uh, no, not that I know of. Um, there is, um, I mean, phages have characteristically struggled with specificity. Um, there is some work actually from a company um, that has done bovis diagnostics coming out of veterinary medicine um, that um, is looking more promising that we are currently getting into R2D2 for validation uh, for TB uh, um, non bovis or more general. Um, so there might be, um, and it's primarily actually um, on the extraction side um, and then uh, confirming it with more specific PCR. So there might be, there might be some development there, but uh, everything I've seen to date uh, was limited by specificity. Okay, yeah. Listen, I think we have to stop there. As always, people have calls at two, two o'clock and Outlook is reminding them etc. But Claudia, thank you. Really very impressive talk. As Kevin says, we all wonder, you know, uh, when you sleep at night and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, great work. And we hope to A, continue collaboration and B, talk again. Absolutely. Would love that. Thank you, Thanks. Dick, for giving me the opportunity. And thank you all for listening. Take care. And if there are questions that I didn't answer, please let me know. Happy to. Thank you, Kevin. Ciao. All right, Mayara. Ciao. Judith, thank you. <laughs>